Some people say, you know, don't matter what order you say, as long as you call them out. Um, but there is a reason, um, and I, I do my best to say verbatim, because there is a reason for the structure, and there's a reason that God had the apostle. Um, and, and I want to share this even with uh, us here, uh, that when we look at the bishops, the office of the bishop, uh, the function of the bishop, um, we've seen in this day and time that there are those that have uh, been a bishop and then they become exposed to the apostleship and they take on the apostleship as if it's a higher rank. Right. As if, okay, you, you know, it's like, okay, you, 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 you done became, um, what's the top office? Um, <laughs> Philadelphia Police Department is the quickest thing I can think of. Uh, the commissioner. Uh, it's like going to the commissioner and then you find out that you can work in another area and you, you, you go to that area as if it's something brand new and you already been doing some of these. Bishops can be apostolic in the sense of function. Uh, when we talk about apostolic, we're not just talking about baptism. Baptism was a part of it, but apostolic doesn't just centrally stop. When we talk about apostolic and even denominational, um, there are a lot of people that say they're apostolic. You really got to listen to them and hear what they're saying because they might be saying two different things. You might be saying one thing, they might be saying something else. And so, uh, but when we use the term apostolic, uh, we you, certainly talk about baptism in Jesus' name, but we don't stop there. We also include that being apostolic is being sent out. As we gave the expression in weeks before, one that's pioneering, one that's going out into the field. And when we say field, we don't mean going into the country where nothing's at. When we talk about a field, we're talking about uh, great possibilities. And so therefore, uh, we go into the possibilities. Uh, the apostle goes into the possibilities of uh, surveying the land, surveying the field, seeing where there is a need. In other words, if there is a community without a church and the local church haven't been presented there and there's no believers, uh, uh, the lack of a better term, um, uh, apostles are glorified missionaries. Normally you hear missionaries being sent out the country, but there are locations in our country right here that needs missionaries, that needs apostles. Apostles are the ones that go out and see that there's a need. Just don't go planting churches just to plant church. Philadelphia is full of churches. I rode down Allegheny uh, Avenue on Christmas Eve, and I was amazed at how many big churches, huge churches, going down Allegheny Avenue in Port Richmond. And I said, well, dear God, what did they do? 50 years ago, 100 years ago, when these buildings were first erected, what happened? And, and, and the communities were coming to church. But they, the pastors, the, the, they were pastors or their denominations, sent out priests, whatever the case may be, whatever they were called, and saw that there was a need in these areas. Now, there might have been a Presbyterian church, the Catholic church, uh, 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 Episcopal church, and so on. And so they saw a need. We are in America partly because of missionaries called pilgrims, Puritans, coming from England to survey the land, see new land. And here we are in the short, paraphrasing what has happened. In short, here we are. And so there was a need. There was not, we know, I'm not talking about the controversy of who got here first. And, you know, Christopher Columbus, he, he got here and, and claimed the land after the fact, you know. And then called, because he thought he was in India, he called those Native American Indians. because he thought he had reached India. No, they were Native Americans. They were here first. He came here afterwards. But um, all that to say, all, a lot of voyages, uh, you know, a lot of the conquests that were um, throughout time, throughout the history of time, 
it was because a lot of it. That's why we say the whole idea of separation of church and state. When we look at history, the church has been very instrumental to, to a lot of areas of what we see in today's time. Um, the phrase of the local church, uh, the, not the local church, the phrase of um, all roads, you know, you know, somebody have an event, they say all roads lead to such and such. And, 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 and it, there was a phrase saying all roads leads to Rome. Why? Because that's where the church was. There was government influence as well. Paved roads, roads was going to Rome. This, you look at history, you start to see how instrumental uh, the church was and it's supposed to still be. So therefore, as we go a little bit further, he said rather they are placed in the Christian community and the world, uh, and the world, I'm sorry, let me go to the, the, the sentence before that. Uh, ministers are placed in the church not to be professional practitioners of religious or reli of religion at the religious building where we visit once a week or weekly. <laughs> weekly or weekly, however you look at it. Um, rather they are placed in the Christian community and the world to model Christ's likeness and to empower fellow believers. And again, we're not going to deal with, okay, we have ministerial lines here. Most certainly this applies to them. But all of us, whether you have a minister title or not, whether you are sister and just brother, in that sense, you're still a minister. You're a servant of God. And so, therefore, as we look at serving, um, we are not placed in community and in the world just to be and hold some title. God didn't call us to hold a title. He called us to work. Right. You can hold a title in the world. You can go do that without being in the church. But a lot of times, people only become things in the church or try to become things uh, and push to become things in the church because that's the only place they can become something. You can't come nothing that become in the world. You can't do nothing in the world. You have made no impact, but you come to church because it looks easier and you feel better about yourself because you lack the self confidence or have a low self esteem. So that makes you feel good. But when you can go out into the world and make change and bring about impact, bring about a difference. That's what, it make, that's what causes the kingdom to expand. The kingdom doesn't expand by titles. It, it expands by work. So, therefore, uh, we are to love, inspire, mentor, train, challenge, discipline, and develop Christians and send them back. Send them back. What does, you know... Here we go with the first kingdom agenda, first kingdom mandate before the Great Commission. This was the Great Commission. In fact, the Great Commission is what I'm about to quote. Most of you already know where I'm going. Genesis 1 and 28. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue and have dominion. That was the first, that was the first mandate given to man. That was kingdom already. It, well, I didn't see Jesus come. The kingdom was already here. We needed Jesus, and, and he's still yet coming to fulfill this, this whole promise of the kingdom, this whole talk of the kingdom, this whole gospel of the kingdom. But the kingdom is present in us. The kingdom was present in Adam. But sin calls him to, to take a step back and misuse his authority. Eve was deceived. Adam just was disobedient. Eve, Eve was deceived. But Adam had the responsibility. And that's why we can't pass off responsibility. When God has given us something and he told us something, we have to be responsible for it. And then not try to blame somebody else for what we should have done. Praise God. 
They are positioned there to make trouble for the devil. For the devil. If you don't make trouble for Satan, you, I, I, I honestly want you to check yourself. I'm not talking about, you know, the sink broke. We're not talking about that ain't the devil. The sink been broke for years. <laughs> that ain't got nothing to do with the devil. It's untimely. It happened at an awkward time. It feels like everything coming at you. God will give you the grace and give you the peace to go through with it. Hallelujah. But we're talking about a super, super spiritual attack. Attack on your emotions. Attack on your finances. Attack on your well-being. Attack on, attack on your mental state. Uh, we're talking about inward battle. We're talking about inward struggles. That's attack. That's, that's, if, you, if the enemy does, he just never troubles you, check yourself. Because you ain't doing nothing, something right. You ain't doing something right if you don't trouble Satan. Now, I'm not telling you that the devil should be on your track. And, you you know, you get up in the testimony service. Oh, you know, the devil uh, tried me this week. And you have that same testimony every week. Something wrong. Something wrong with that, too. The devil shouldn't be trying you 24-7. You should have some peace somewhere. We talk about the God of our salvation. He brings us peace. So if he brings us a peace, oh, it, it, I mean, everything come out your mouth. We ain't even talking about testimony, sir. How you doing? Oh, well, you know. There, there's got to be something God is doing in your life. And if you, if, you, if you open your eyes good enough, you'll see what the Lord is doing. But the enemy tends to try to keep our focus on how 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 few things that are bad look like it's greater than everything else that's going on good in our lives. He'll, he'll magnify that instead of magnifying, uh, you know, of course, of course Satan ain't going to magnify. But you got to train yourself to start magnifying what God is doing. You can keep magnifying Satan and it draws your energy. It's exhausting. Praise God. You're, we're positioned there to make trouble for the, the devil, to make a positive difference in the lives of others. What you do does matter. Oh, what I do don't matter. They don't see me. Your impact matters. Who you are matters. It mattered enough over 2,000 years ago that he gave his life for us. Your life matters. And people are waiting to hear about the good news of the kingdom and the gospel of the good news. Uh, the gospel is the good news. The gospel of the kingdom is good news. All of us just good. They're waiting for you to share that. They're waiting for you to be it. And also to bring glory to God. These ministers are called the servants of, uh, all called to be servants of God's children, tutors and governors to prepare his offspring for the appointed time in this life and the next to rule and reign with him. I want you to understand that once we come down and see the new Jerusalem, excuse me, see the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven and Jesus takes his rightful place in the new earth. It's going to be a glorious time. But we will not be shouting and dancing all day. All right? You know, I love, and I made reference to this before, I love to hear the old song every now and then. I like, I like, I like to hear it until I start thinking about the words. <laughs> Some of y'all like that. You like to hear music, and then when you get a revelation or understanding of what it is, you're like, oh, all right. You know, it don't have the same oomph that it used to have. My mother person was singing the song, walking around heaven all day. We're going to be walking. It won't be forever. Not there. We're going to be reigning here in the earth, in the new earth. Won't be no sickness, no more pain. It won't be none of that. But it's going to be work. That don't mean you're going to be working in the sweat of your brow. Well, that was a curse for, for Adam and for us, passed down, pass down to us, that we would have to work. Till the ground, till the sweat come. That wasn't God's intention. 
that we have a job. It was his intention for us to work. He gave him a responsibility to work from the very beginning. The very words, be fruitful, multiply, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue and have to mean. Those are all functioning terms or phrases. Uh, You just don't say them and expect results. You got to be them. You got to do something. You got to work. We have to work. So therefore, God is preparing us. And this is what the local church uh, is the hub of the Christian ministry. It is the place where the rubber meets the road. The local God. God always wanted to be local. For us to even put God like he's so far, but then we pray and want him to be so close. We have to understand God always wanted to be local. He's just not a God of the universe. No, he's my God. He's my Savior. He's my Redeemer. He's my salvation. He's my healer. He's my deliverer. He's my keeper. God always wanted to be local. This is obvious because in Scripture we find him even with the beginning, even with Adam. He came down and visited man time and again. He even instructed Moses to build him a tabernacle so that he could dwell among his people. And then the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God became local with a birth certificate and street address. And when the word made flesh departed from this earth, he promised that God would soon become more local yet. This time, he would not only dwell with his people, but he would dwell in them. Not just dwell with them. We ain't just hanging with Jesus. No, he, he's living inside of me. So God always wanted to be local. And by means of indwelling in them, they will become a composite local expression of the deity to those who do not know him. Jesus instructed his followers to make him local. Go and teach all nations. Go into all the world among all nations. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other uttermost parts of the earth. Go into the world. Go teach all nations. Go into the world. Go. We can never be global by staying inside the four walls. Hallelujah. Now that's global. Let's come local. We can never be local if we stay inside the four walls. Thank you, Jesus. If we stay inside the four walls and keep what God is doing to us, God can't become local because you won't even localize him. You won't even vocalize him. You won't even be his voice because you won't even, no, when I come to church, I do do church. That term, do church. Do church. You you ought to be and not just do. Be a doer. Be a doer till you become. Be a doer of the word and not hearers only. The early local church, the early local church, the pristine model to which most of us reverently look and desire to emulate was first and foremost a local church. First it was the church at Jerusalem. Then it became the church at Rome, Corinth, Ephesus, Galatia, Thessalonica, all these geographical geographical settings. Most of the epistles are letters sent to local churches. Even, uh, I'm sorry, either individual churches or group of local bodies making the letter encyclical to be taken and read from one local congregation to another. There was a time in the early church, especially upon the first, second, third centuries, there were times when they would come together for their meetings. They would come together for their meetings and a lot of 
what they meant, bishops, priests, all from all type, all across the world would come together um, in an ecumenical setting, and they would talk, they have meetings, they would take notes, and I forget the name, it would not come back to me right now, but I'm, I'll am i make sure I present it to you. I, I, I shared it with you before some time ago, quite some time ago, but I want to share it with you again. And I was in class, and my responsibility was to bring this certain year of this ecumenical gathering and talk about some of the things that they were dealing with. I looked at that and I said, huh, so what I'm dealing with ain't new. <laughs> some of this stuff we think, we were like, oh, uh, yeah. it just arrived. Yeah. <laughs> it ain't just arrived. They've been dealing with this stuff all the time. Now, when you want to appropriate the scripture, that's, that's when it's appropriate to say, there's nothing new under the sun. It's already been done. Just a new group of people, new location, somewhere else in a certain, another time. But you'll be surprised, some of the same things. And so these, these conversations, these letters, the early local church, they would take the letters from church to church, from house to house, talk, teach from those letters. And those letters addressed whatever was taking place in that church at that time. So every church didn't have the same letter. But as we see now, these epistles have come and, and, and they have been canonized to bring us this Bible that we call the Word of God. And, and this Bible really has become a, a, a guide to us. But no different if we wrote a letter, if we were off uh, ministering, being an apostle, pl planting another church or so on, um, and we wrote a letter to you about some concerns that we had, then you will understand why these letters are written. So they're just not written just to write. God was using the men of God to answer whatever problems were going on at that time. This is why we say you don't have to, you really don't have to go find a self-help book. Just open your Bible. Because everything that has been discussed, the answer is in the word of God. A place where people meet God. And so that local church becomes the place where people meet God. It is in the local church context that people are born again. Lives are changed. People receive counsel and assistance in crises. Marriages are made and restored. Children are dedicated to the Lord and instructed. Disciples receive the call to special ministry. Let me back up to this part. Uh, children are dedicated to the Lord and instructed. This is very, very important that children are involved in the house of God. I've seen um, a change in the way, and even I had to pray and ask the Lord, show, 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 show me what new harvest, what we need. Give us direction. Give me direction and, and show us. Are we to continue having a Sunday school? What, what are we supposed to do with Sunday school? The attendance, since I've been born, has been a little shaky. What do we do to change this? How do we get from here? And for a while, I just had no answer. I'm just waiting on God. I have had friends. I've talked to friends. I've talked to friends who are pastors. And, and, they, and they say, we, we canceled it out. Because the people won't come. And I, I, got, I, I got disturbed. I said, I had to ask God, now what was the purpose? Why are we doing this? Because I, I don't want to do church just because we've been doing church. There's got to be a purpose behind it. Everything we do in service, from prayer to scripture, to a song, to a song, uh, even before the preacher, the offering, all this. When is this, this liturgy, this order of service, you just don't come out with something just because we want to do something different. God, what is the meaning? 
of this. And the Lord would not release me to let us not have a Sunday school. And I asked God, and God has brought us to this day and this time, and I've seen it change. Yes, sir. And I said, God, I thank you. I praise you. But it got to even get better than this. And God is going to, is going to get better than this. Yes, sir. And I think about the children. I said, a lot of things that I know comes from Sunday school. Yes, sir. Mother Parker was my teacher. Sister Tina was my teacher. I don't even know who else was my teacher. I just remember them too. But they were my teachers. So it is a great honor to, sit, to stand here as Mother Parker's pastor. She the one that was at the altar who prayed with me. Hallelujah. June 26, 1990 on a Tuesday night. <laughs> so you understand but it was Sunday school when I think about it it was Sunday school how now I know everybody hasn't had the great experience and have the same perspective or same thought pattern and, and I know the church has taken church world is we, it's a lot of things going on. I just say it like that. A lot of things going on. Not saying all bad. This is just a lot of things going on. Yeah. And so, and I look at that and I say, so Elder Lewis gave the scripture on uh, Friday night at the celebration. What's the scripture he come out with? Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Yes, Psalm 1. Yes, the entire Psalm I believe he read. Do yeah. you not know that's one of the scriptures I was rehearsing a couple weeks ago because I said it's been quite some time I remember I, at one point I could tell you verbatim what Psalm 1 and 1 through 8 I believe 8 or 9 8 was verbatim I'm talking about 10-15 years after growing up still can give it to you right now it's not fresh in my mind but a couple weeks ago I was I said Lord I need to rehearse this because I remember when I could say it. Now I'm going back to it. Here he comes. Again, it brought back that appreciation. Hallelujah. Because what, what does that have to do with anything? And you talk about Sunday school. It was in Sunday school. Mother Parker gave that to us. Right. To Riverside. So. Y'all stop telling people don't memorize stuff. I don't know if y'all are. But if y'all please stop. Because Memory. The more you rehearse it, the more to get in you. Right. Now, whether I can say it verbatim right. and live it verbatim is two different things. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Whether I say it verbatim, I mean, I can say it verbatim this very moment, but living it verbatim That's it. is my goal. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. So, therefore, Sunday school, the, 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 this very essence, so God has blessed me to remember things. Some things I can remember better than others. But some things God just allows me to recall at different times. And, and when I recall going over different things, going through the books, the, uh, it, it, a lot of what we produce so Sunday school is just not a time we come together just to waste time. Hallelujah. Just to come together and have another thing on our checklist. We got Sunday school. Check. This is another ministry. This is another part of church. We just do this to get the people there on time for church. That's not what we do. This is this is Feeding of knowledge of the word of God. Bible study is just equally important. The feeding of the word of God and the feeding of the word of God empowers us to go live and walk out there and be able to make an impact. 
Many people, many young people, many churches have been built up because of how the Sunday school program brought kids. Now, now, there are incentives to it. And the incentive is, let's get the kids from the neighborhood come to church. We can get the kids from the local, church, local neighborhood to come to Sunday school. After a while, they keep coming. I don't care if you feed them peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You, whatever you give them, after a while, many of our families have come into church because of a young child first coming in. Vacation Bible school. Now, I'm throwing this out here now because I'm, I'm intentional. <laughs> so I'm not just throwing this out here just to throw it and it just land anywhere and we just see where it goes. No, I'm intentionally saying that at this juncture. Vacation Bible school is necessary. You haven't had it in probably 20 years. But it's necessary because that is another vehicle which God, it's not just, again, something to check off. We doing this. We busy. We appear busy. You know how many people appear busy ain't doing nothing. I went to one church. I won't call it a name. I went to one church and I just, <laughs> I'm, I'm um, I love to see what other churches do. It, it, it piques my, it's my curiosity. I love to, I'm open to new ideas. I'm open to anything God is in. And um, I looked at the program. So in the back of the program had a list of all the auxiliaries. I mean, it must have been about three or four pages. <laughs> I stopped counting. I said, this is too much. I know it was a large shirt, but I said, this is too much. I, I'm sweating. I'm sweating now. I'm sweating. I said, what in the world? All these auxiliaries. And I just, I, I really, if the opportunity ever presents itself, I'll talk to the pastor or the interim pastor and see. Are, these, are all of these auxiliaries active? In my mind, I was like, I just, I really don't, you know, that might be good for them. I'm not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It just looked busy. But there are a lot of people that look busy, ain't doing nothing. Yeah, yeah if it's, you know, kids look busy when you come in the house. They know you was, they were supposed to do their chores. They know you come in the house. They hear that key rattling. They get to move in. Now they act like they've been cleaning the living room the whole time. You, wasn't, you just ran in here. Yeah. We saw you through the blinds. We saw you come down the steps. And they all oh, look like they oh look like they've been very busy. You ain't been busy. Excuse my grammar. You ain't been busy. <laughs> you just you just arrived at the trash can and it looked like you was picking the trash up because we done told you actually twenty times we got the trash. And now because we're home, now you wanna look busy. My time is gone. <laughs> yeah, your teacher walk out. Thank you, Dr. Person. Your teacher walk out. Everybody doing everything. You talking, you're chilling, gone, you you whoever in the closet, whatever, going to water fountain. As soon as the teacher step back in, everybody rush and sit down. Like like you like you've been there all the time. Praise God. We don't want to look like that in church. We don't want to look so busy that we're not doing God's business. You can be busy, but not doing God's business. Uh, but this is the house, the local church, is where people, uh, children are dedicated to the Lord and instructed. Disciples receive called to special ministry. Sick are ministered to and dead are buried. Justly or not, most people's view of the Lord Jesus Christ is largely determined, excuse me, by what they have seen in whatever local church in uh, whatever in whatever local church is in their lives or communities. In the event of, I'm sorry, and with the advent of tremendous media ministries, many of which do great, which do great good in the lives of people, nothing has or can replace the power of personal touch. And this is found primarily in the local church. All believers, including all ministers, should have a wholesome personal relationship and commitment to some local church. Hebrews 10 and 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love 
and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day uh, approaching. As you see the day approaching. We're coming close to the end of this chapter, but we won't conclude it today. Um, we're going into the value of the local church, and we'll talk about those uh, subtopics there. But all believers, all believers, including all ministers, should have a wholesome, personal relationship and commitment to some local church. Yes. To some local church. Yes. Why? Because this is where we're fed. This is where we're taught. This is where God breathes. This is where God moves. <coughs> Praise the Lord. I think that's Mother... Um, just go speak to her, lady. Mother Burt, Mom Burt, robe lady. Yes, thank you. Uh, all believers, including all ministers, should have a wholesome, personal relationship and commitment to some local church. And if we all consider ministers in the general sense, we know everybody's not going to through a going to be a preacher and so on, but in the general sense, us being believers, we're all ministers, we're all servants of God. We all are to have a wholesome relationship with a local church. And I'll say it, we're going to say this and, and, and dismiss, uh, but we got to come against the philosophy that as long as I have a relationship with God, I'm fine. No, you're not fine. Not for two, it's kind of twofold. What are you getting, being taught? And you don't even know how to decipher what you're reading. Wh who's teaching you? What's teaching you? And then, how are you being accountable to be responsible for the impact that you're making? I'm a child of God. Now, if you're a child of God and you love God, it's not just simply being a child of God. And as long as I pray to him, that's, that should solve everything. No. It should go to the point that I love God. And if I love God, I got to love the things God loves. Just as the word said, you got to hate the things that he hate, abhor the things that he hate. Look, we got to love the things that God loves and hate the thing he hates. I'm going to say it again. We got to love the things that God loves and hate the things that he hates. So therefore, whatever he loves, that's what I got to find myself loving. And I'm not, it's not just simple as just loving it. Because then I must just define what is love. And my definition has to line up with the love that the word of God is saying love it. So therefore, I got to love it, not just love it, but I got to also love it how God loves it. I just, you know, I, I, he just don't love his people. No, I got to love his people how he loves them. Because your definition of love could be uh, short of where God's definition of love is. So therefore, I, I don't want to miss God and also I don't want to misrepresent God. Because we are his representatives. So when we are his representatives, we're representing Christ. And as we represent Christ, we're representing him. And as we represent him, we have to love the things he loves, hate the things he hates. And we pray that you are empowered to leave Christian empowerment empowered. That's our prayer. That's our goal. So make sure you're empowered to go out there and make the impact. Amen. Yes. Somebody give God the glory. Hallelujah. Come on and give God the praise. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this session. 
Lord, as we've gone through the word and gone through this book that you have allowed your servant to hear from you and be guided through the word of God with biblical sound, uh, biblical sound principles, God, to present to us. God, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the lesson. We thank you for the words on each page. God, Lord, we ask you to continue to bless and keep the writer, our leader, our covering. God, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, continue to bless us, the local church, to make an impact for your name. We want to bring pleasure to your heart and fame to your name. We want Satan to be horrified and terrified because we have woken up. We have awakened to give you glory, to give you praise in the community and our family, on our jobs, in our careers, and whatever we're doing, we want you to be glorified. So, God, we present our gifts to you. Lord, we present our skills to you. We present our knowledge to you. We stand and sit humble before you. God, that you will continue to empower us to impact a world. Lord, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.